we want to talk about, again, I uh, spent some time, I was invited to the wedding, but I decided to, uh, my wife took me out to eat somewhere. And then um, afterwards, spent some time to kind of pray and really feel, I, I didn't feel the message. I felt the heart of Jesus for this evening. And uh, it just, I felt that this heart imparted for some people that are in this room and the people that will be watching. Um, it's not easy to preach three services. I preached twice on Sunday. Uh, three times is, is a little bit challenging. And so it takes, it takes me an hour to spend time in prayer just to kind of forget about the services that existed so that, so that evening service can be almost like it's a first service. Not another third service where we come in worn out and tired, even if you're worn out and tired. Um, I know Jesus is not worn out and tired, and I don't want to be worn out and tired. Amen? I want this to be a fresh manna today that will touch your heart. And I pray the Holy Spirit will help us uh, to, to receive that. I'm going to finish um, this weekend on, on freedom. And if you're taking notes, note takers or history makers, there's a passage in the Bible somewhere that says that if you take notes, higher chances of going to heaven. I just came up with that, so, but um, a short pencil is better than a long memory. And so I want you to title this uh, short, and anytime a preacher says short, he's lying, so I just lied, Jesus forgive me, um, a long talk that will be called Remove Grave Clothes. Remove Grave Clothes. And somebody say amen. amen. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. Remove Grave Clothes. If you have your Bible, let's go to John chapter 11 verse 44. And it says the following, when he who had died came out, somebody say came out. Came out. Okay, now everybody say came out. came out. Touch your neighbor, say it's time for you to come out. <laughs> Not leave, but just like come out, okay. Came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Loose him and let him go. This was his friend. It was Lazarus. He died. He was sick and then he died. And when he died, they didn't just put him in a the grave. They bound him with grave clothes. They bound him in his face. They bound him in his feet. And they bound him in his hands. And they put him in a grave. They put him in a tomb. And Jesus got the news that your friend is sick you have to come and heal him Jesus waited for a few more days and his friend got dead he went from being sick to being dead and he comes they removed the stone he spoke out loud said Lazarus come out and Lazarus came out bound it took him some time to get out of the grave because he was bound he couldn't walk properly and when he came out Jesus looked at the crowd and he says now you guys go and loose him and that was his friend. Before Jesus spoke that into the tomb, he wept and groaned for his friend who was dead. Sin does three things. First thing, it makes us spiritually sick. Secondly, sin makes us spiritually dead. And thirdly, sin binds us. Number one, sin makes us sick. When you get diseased with sin, you begin to, you know, sick people, they develop fevers. Sick people, they, uh, they, they can't move. There's rashes, it hurts, it, it pains. And that's the first task of sin. When it comes in, it's not unto death. It just causes you to get sick. You start skipping church. You start skipping your Bible reading. You start skipping prayer. It makes you sick. But sin doesn't stop there. If that sickness is not treated, if that sickness is not cured, it leads to spiritual death. Death is separation. Death is not that you stop coming to church sometimes. In fact, you just spiritually die. And then when the sin sees that you're spiritually dead, it says, while you're dead, let's bind you. Because it's easy to bind a dead person. There's no resistance, correct? Dead people don't create resistance. It's only the living that create resistance. And so the devil wants to bind the dead people because, well, it's easy to do that. And the second reason he likes to bind the dead people is that in case any time if Jesus happens to come by their zip code and raises them from the dead so they can stay still stuck even if they're alive. Sin binds. Sin kills. And sin makes us sick. And uh, I, I will borrow you since you were so kind to me. Remind me your name again? Mark. Mark, Mark please come. I feel actually really bad for you already. <laughs> but um, 
I'm going to illustrate that, not because you guys are kindergarten, but it just makes it a little bit easier to, to remember one, and it, it sends a deeper message than what you hear. And so what sin does, and for those of you watching me on live stream, just, just hold on for a second. Seeing it and experiencing that is way different. And trust me, it hurts. What sin does is this, is that when it sees that you're spiritual, sometimes it waits for you to die. Other times what it does is it comes creeping on your life and sin binds. See, sin is not an act. It's a, it's a tape. It sticks to you. It doesn't let you go. And it has its own agenda. And the Bible says that Lazarus came out bound. He was alive, but he was bound. And the first place that he was bound in the Bible says was in his feet. Put your feet together. Was in his feet. Now, one of the reasons why sin binds you at your feet is so that... Huh? the sin binds you in your feet for this reason so you don't walk after God you don't have a lifestyle but that you have leaps with God I'm gonna demonstrate it to you walk walk jump begin to jump mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. That's after the conference, yeah. I want you to notice, I want you to notice something with him right now. I walk, he leaps. Anytime you're bound, anytime you're bound, you don't have a lifestyle of walking with God. You only live by leaps called conferences and camps. The Bible says that he who is bound to sin is a slave to sin and he doesn't dwell in the house forever, meaning there is no consistency. People, many times, who don't have a lifestyle with God, they live off of services instead of their devotional life. Because something is not free there. And the purpose of sin is to make you live. At, at first, there's nothing it seems like wrong with it. Well, I look forward to revival on the service. I look forward to a guest speaker to come. I look forward to a conference there and conference there. And conferences are good, but you have to understand is the devil wants you to live off of conferences because as long as you depend on somebody's walk with God, it means your own walk is limited. And it's not limited because God wants it limited. The limited is because the enemy wants it to be limited. He bounds your feet. You're alive but bound. Talk to me. Are you with me? All right. And so, Mark, come back. Now, he can manage, you see? And that's how a lot of people do. They manage with their bondage. They manage not living a lifestyle. They manage having certain restrictions in their spiritual walk. They still manage. Not for long. The scripture says not only he had his feet bound, it says that he had his hands bound. Have you noticed hands? What do hands speak of? We do a few things with hands. We lift them in worship and we lift them in prayer. Are you with me? What the enemy loves to do is not only to bind our walk, but also to bind our talk. To bind our, our relationship with the Lord. Many of you, you have a hard time lifting your hands at church. You have no problem giving a middle finger to somebody in the highway. Mm-hmm. 
No problem hitting somebody. No problem taking a piece of gum from a grocery store and taking it out. But when it comes to reaching your hand into your pocket during giving, your hand becomes withered like the guy in the Bible with the withered hand. It just doesn't move because it's bound. People say, well, I just go to a church where lifting hands during worship is prohibited. Well, I wish you wouldn't lift them anywhere else. You watch a football game and your hands go up. Didn't your church teach you not to lift them during football game? Didn't your church teach you not to watch the football game? Hypocrisy at its finest. The enemy wants to bind our hands so that we don't lift them like holy hands, the Bible says, in praise and in worship to God. But it doesn't stop that. The scripture says that Lazarus was bound with his feet. Lazarus was bound with his hands. He was alive. The blood was flowing. They were capable. The only thing is they were restricted. And the most painful part is... is uh, for those of you uh, watching, just, just watch. The Bible says that he was bound with cloth in his face. Let's come, let's come close so that we can all see it better. Now stay strong because if you feel you fall. I'm sure it has a strange, but I don't know if it covers illustrations. One of the first things that the enemy likes to find, I joined the brain. Jesus says so you're hearing don't hear so you come to church a preacher preach for 40 minutes you know it was good they ask you what was it about I don't know <laughs> yet when they ask you what's the NFL score of your favorite team from the back of your head you know every single player you know what they do you know who they're married you know the name of their cat and if we ask you, you know, what's, what's the first four or five books that Moses wrote? Who? Moses? Which Moses? A lot of times this is the problem, is that there's a problem with hearing. And many people have this problem in the church. A lot of times they come to church and, and, and I believe it's a spiritual problem where you can't pay attention in church. But you can watch Stranger Things season two in one setting. But you can watch Netflix TV show in one setting, all ten episodes in one setting, barely blinking. And 30 minute message. <sighs> Man, why is this church so boring? <laughs> the enemy binds us, and church becomes dull. The very things that other people, the same person in the same service, sits there weeping taking notes and said, God just changed my life. And you're sitting there and you're like, Man, I'm bored out of my life. And enemy loves to bind our hearing it doesn't stop with hearing he gets your ears Because the enemy loves 
us to get our eyes on the hook so that our eyes don't burn with fire of God, but our eyes burn with lust. We don't see the Lord because our eyes are bound. And Samson didn't control his eyes, and the scripture says is that still it seems they took him out. He wants to bind your ears. He wants to bind your eyes. And when he succeeds with that, he binds your mouth. So you don't speak. So you don't preach. So you don't praise. So you don't pray. So you don't worship. So you don't prophesy. You mean you don't become a vessel that speaks to other people. And I will spare him from a near-death experience by not biting his nose. No, no, I am tempted. Write this down. When I am bound, I live by leaps of faith instead of lifestyle of faith. Write this down is that when I am bound, I live by conferences and services instead of my own walk with the Lord. I believe the church service is not supposed to be a place where you get fed. It's a place where you serve. The only people who come to their parents and said, I'm not being fed are toddlers. If you're a grown up and you live with your parents, you come to your mom and your dad and you say, I'm hungry, there's nothing to eat. What is your mama gonna say? There is a fridge, you go get it yourself. If you don't want it, well be hungry. Anytime people come to our church or your church and they say, I left the church, why? I'm not being fed. That means that you don't have a relationship with God where you are fed every day and you come to church you, you don't have a place to serve you're not serving at church you are in church receiving only and sooner or later you become a couch potato and when you become a couch potato you no longer see the need of people you see the problems and you see the mistakes and you see this and you see that and God doesn't want us to live like that this man he had these ropes I want to tell you the four main things that the enemy uses our generation to bind especially the generation that is represented in front of me in front of the live stream and in this room the first one is rejection bless you rejection offense bitterness or betrayal it's when you get hurt by the people that you love the most rejection is when you the trust that you place in somebody and they break it. Rejection is when your father who was supposed to be there in your house to affirm you but you grow up without him. Rejection is when you find out that when mama got pregnant with you she never wanted you. You were a burden and you carry that sense of why I don't belong anywhere. Rejection is when the person that you fell in love with they dump you and your heart is broken rejection is many times when you get fired or you get kicked out rejection comes in different shapes and different forms but rejection goes deep and it creates a root and it becomes a chain that satan uses and that produces many times within us bitterness it produces within us we 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 rebel but in reality we're hurting we're just trying to punish parents we're just trying to make a statement we're just trying to catch somebody's attention because in, inside we're bleeding there's many young people today who not only through abuse but through rejection they, they, they see their life being bound and their life being destroyed because of rejection and I want to tell you that in this room if you feel that there, that there is this, some rejection that's been unresolved or, or some betrayal or some maybe bitterness that's already fostering in your heart the devil will take advantage of that because he wants to hold you back that even if you are breathing that you're not moving because people who have been rejected and live by that rejection this is what happens is their life continues but they are stuck in the event where they've been hurt the clock is moving except them they live they are imprisoned in that very event which they have been hurt by sometimes you get rejected in ministry 
you start serving and the people that you serve they can throw a lawsuit at you they can blackmail you they can call you with things and if you don't if this sounds strange to you you haven't been ministering to the new people yet if you want to be a bridge to a dying world you have to know one thing you will be walked upon people will walk upon you ask Jesus the very people he came to reach they crucified him and he still loved people you will get wounded Jesus has scars and he is perfect one every everybody in this room has, is going to have to get scars and the only reason we don't have scars is not because we haven't been wounded most of us we just haven't been healed wounds that are neglected become wounds infected time doesn't heal time helps but only Jesus heals if time would have healed God wouldn't send his son he would send the clock rejection that we experience from our parents lack of affection of the father's love sometimes especially those of you who are grew up in a Slavic homes Ukrainian home or, or Russian home where the father is like a like a mini Hitler and please forgive me most of them are not here so I'm kind of fine right now I'll just talk to you straight meaning like this this rough rough man who says you know what I brought you into this world you keep talking I'll take you out I provide for you I put a roof over your house and you know what shut up you know and we live in the world where we were created inside of us we, we, we crave for love we crave for affection and some people experience rejection because somebody actually hurt them but some people experience rejection because somebody didn't love them to the degree that they really needed to be loved I remember when I've experienced them before I got married my dad is a genius in full sense of that word he he can quote you a poem that has 32 verses from his middle school in the Ukraine verse by verse 32 of them he knows more of those poems that honestly it, it fat fathoms me how his brain operates he never went to college because he was Christian he was denied to do that he can fix cars he can fix ACs he, he has magic powers if my AC in the house is broken or car is broken he steps into the room I am not exaggerating my wife is a witness and my relatives are a witness he steps into the room everything starts working he leaves it stops working <laughs> I asked him one time he practices magic <laughs> he's like dad you're not normal my dad's wish for me because he's such a genius he fixes things and he's very smart he was hoping that I will take after him that I will you know fix things that I will be like, in construction that I will do you know like things that that normal normal Ukrainian people do in America who are not who don't have education and so and he was expecting me to do that and so but for me I'm just not like that I'm just not wired like that I'm more like my mom I'm just just very different and so and because of that I felt that don't get me wrong I adore my dad my dad is like my my biggest hero he's, he's the godliest man I've known he's such a humble man but for a long time until the age of 24 I did not feel or hear from my dad that he was happy with me in fact when at the age of 17 I told him that I'm going to be in a full-time ministry him and my mom were crying not out of happiness but out of disappointment they did not want me to be in full-time ministry because they knew that financially I will not be able to provide for my family and I'm a bad example for the siblings by going into full-time ministry for two months I prayed to God and I said God if you don't change my parents minds I can't go into full-time ministry I did not know it took me a year to come to that decision and I'm thinking my parents would be the first cheerleaders and then there they are standing and saying son we didn't come to America so you can die broke why, why what, what, what what makes you want to go into ministry you don't even know what you're doing pastors they don't pay them well, what are you gonna do who's gonna pay who's gonna take care of your needs and so and seeing that I saw the seed of disappointment in the fact that I'm trying to serve God and they were Christians my dad is a treasurer at church our ministry started to kind of grow my influence started to increase at the age of 24 you know a lot of people in, in our city they know who I am because we used to be on television on social media etc and so and my dad meets a lot of people now who recognize his last name and they, they they ask him if he's my father so one time he went to Lowe's which is his favorite place he bought some tools and bought some material and the lady who was checking uh, checking uh, him out and giving him the receipt and everything she looked at his credit card and she says oh you're Mr. Sovchuk and he says well I am he says well I well what an honor I know your son and so she starts saying how great I am which is not uncommon <laughs> 
So my dad comes back home and my dad says, you guys not going to believe what happened. Somebody looked at my last name and they recognized my last name and I know how the story goes. So I'm thinking my dad's going to finally realize that his son, you know, is not an idiot. His son, you know, is someone to be proud of. In the city, they don't talk to him about like, like he's a drug dealer or something. He's, he, he, he sells hope, not dope. He's a good man. <laughs> so I'm opening my mouth, expecting that there's going to be this part where dad will say, you know what? I'm so glad, you know, people in our city, they know our son and for good things. And my dad keeps bragging about how awesome his last name is. And I'm like a starving child, 24, I'm a youth pastor and I'm starving to hear a word from my dad. I'm proud of you. And that word never came. I remember the family meeting was over. Everybody went Pashatram, went to their tents, into the rooms. And I'm there, I still see that picture right now. In the living room, lights are off, I'm sitting on the couch and I'm crying. And I said, God, what can I do to make my dad be happy with me? I have people that are impressed and blessed from different parts of the world but my dad is not and so I said you know what I'm gonna try to help my dad with what he does it's construction at the time he was building a house so he asked me he said hey could you come after your church work and come and, and help me to cut some tile in the bathroom and I'm just gonna be honest with you that's just not my my gifting he took some expensive tile that he bought in Lowe's on discount, specific rare, limited amount. He told me to go cut little corners. I broke every piece of tile that he gave me. My dad was so disappointed, he kicked me out of his house. And he says, get out of here before you destroy everything else. And there I am thinking, you know what, I'm good for nothing. My own dad, and I'm beginning to build resentment toward my dad. I'm feeling rejected even though he's not doing anything back. I just feel like he's not, he's not, I'm not good enough for him. I get married and I still carry that until one time me and my wife, she loves sushi. She takes me to sushi and I'm not a big fan of sushi. I like Olive Garden because appetizers are big. <laughs> one of the reasons I don't like sushi is because you go to a sushi restaurant and they bring the, you these appetizers where like it's a big plate and you see the plate coming you get it, your stomach gets excited you're like oh my god we're gonna have a good appetizer we will take the meal to go so we can eat it at home tomorrow save some money and the plate arrives it's a big plate and it has six leaves that they picked up in the backyard and sprayed with some Chinese black sour cream or some kind of a some kind of a thing you looked at that thing and I remember I looked at it was this vivid memory I'm looking and I am mad I'm looking at my wife and I said that's why I hate anything that has Japanese Chinese or anything that's Asian because they rip people off six bucks for six leaves next time I'm bringing my own leaves and my wife said something that was very very deep she says, well, the appetizer wasn't supposed to replace the main meal. She said, it was supposed to wet your appetite for the main meal. It wasn't supposed to be the main meal. Olive Garden has a bigger appetizer. Sushi places have a very small one. But the point is to get you ready for the main meal. When she said that, I'm like, this sounds deep. <laughs> I know there has to be a revelation behind this. <laughs> the next morning. I'm praying and wrecks my, this, this revelation wrecked my life and the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Vlad, your father is your appetizer. I am your main meal. He was never meant to love you so much that you don't need me. He was only meant to wet your appetite so that you're ready for the main meal. He said, you're angry at your dad for not give you Olive Garden salad because he gave you six or seven leaves. He was only meant to prepare you for my love. He said, you're expecting too much out of him and too little out of me. Man, I had an encounter today. I wept like I've never wept before.
I cried before my heavenly father and I repented and I said God I'm so sorry because I squeezed out of my dad everything honestly the reason why my dad loved me like that is the way my dad was loved by his father it's not my dad's fault and God freed me at that day from the chain of that rejection that I feel and I loosed my dad I let my dad go in my heart think and realizing that what he gave me is the best he had but he prepared me for the main meal which is the love of the Abba father are you with me? This is, I feel like this is setting somebody free in this room right now. And after that, I made a decision. I will never again expect my dad to give me something he doesn't have. And instead of expecting him to love me, I started to make sure I honor him in a way that he's the best father. So I stopped taking care, focusing on when he's going to honor me, bless me and appreciate me, say something nice. I'm just watching, make sure I always honor my dad. Coming alongside said that I know I can't fix style. Well, I'm pretty much going to do half of the things that you need me to do. But hey, can I clean your car? Can I tell you how many times I took my dad's car when he was working on the house and I cleaned that car. I licked that car. He couldn't wreck it. He, he asked me, what, 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 what car is this? Because I cleaned it. He wasn't clean for like four or five years because it was a construction car. But, but that's the only thing I could do. I couldn't help him with what he would need help with. So I started to do that. Not so he can say, thank you, son. Well, you finally worked for something. You're good for something. I said, you know what, dad? You gave me six leaves. I ate them. Thank you. Not enough. But you know what? It got me ready for my heavenly father. And my heavenly father gave me so much that now I can give it back to you. Something started to take place. I was in California preaching at the youth conference. Uh, revival center preaching at the youth conference was had a great great service at the end I get a text message from my dad and it was like one of the first times I heard I saw my dad texting back that was a miracle number one and my dad texted me in Ukrainian and I'm like wait they had a right live stream so he's saying you and my me and your mother were watching the live stream and so it kind of shocked me that they had live stream I didn't even know they had live stream so my dad found the live stream he was watching and he said this he says son both of us were in tears and we want to let you know how proud we are that you're a son I'm standing there and like and people are looking, they're thinking like I, my grandma died or something. And they're like, is everything okay? I was like, I'm just kidding. I just want to be with God right now. I'm like, ah. But I don't need it anymore. <laughs> when I don't need it, I got it. When I needed it, I couldn't get it. You know what happened? Because my father was the appetizer. Heavenly Father was the main meal and I started to treat my dad differently. Instead of expecting something, I started honoring him. It released the love he didn't even have for me because he, he didn't grow up like that, loving like that. He didn't grow up with that affection. The crazy part, my tile cutting skills improved. <laughs> the next house he was building, I actually was cutting most of the tile. My dad was calling me for like advice. He was saying, hey, how should we do this? How should we do that? I became like his buddy when it came to construction. My relationship improved with my dad. It completely changed. Today he's, he's one of my friends. He's not just my father. He's one of my friends. And we talk like friends. He asked me for advice. I give him. We pray for each other. He grabbed my book. When I released the Russian book, he says, the first one is mine. He says, it's my book. He was walking around showing it to everybody. He said, that's, that's, that's my book. My, my son wrote this book. And today I have a healthy relationship with my dad. But it started with me getting healed from the rejection that I was feeling and how did I get healed when realizing my dad is not my main meal he's my appetizer maybe you never got the appetizer maybe your parents were never there to even give you the appetizer can I tell you something you can still get the main meal and when you get the main meal you can love your parents and honor them you may say but they don't deserve it nor do you but when you love them something happens it changes when you honor your parents it changes them like crazy are you with me the first chain I told you Mark you're gonna stand here for some time so we'll get we'll get to your, your part where you're gonna hurt a little bit more but a little bit later <clears throat> the second chain so the first one is rejecting the second thing that the enemy wants to bind us with is addiction write this down addiction 
The second rope that he likes to bind us with is with addiction. To hold us back from God. To hold us back from walking with God. To hold us back from running after God. And we can be alive, breathing like he is. You're alive, right, Mike? Okay, all right. So we can be alive but be bound. You can be alive but some of you, you're struggling today with because you haven't received the Father's love. And right now, and, and today, God wants to release that Father's love on you. In fact, the young lady who was helping me in the morning, can you, can you come? Who was helping me in the morning on the piano? Was it you? Oh, no, it wasn't you. That was you? Can you come up? Can you come up for a second? It, it's, it's, sorry. Or, or you, or you, both of you, both of you go. <laughs> okay, you, you go, you go. It's your, it's your night. I'm sorry. <laughs> Dear Holy Spirit, I ask you right now that you will, you will come. For those of you in this room, when I share this story, I pretty much described your situation. That's exactly what you're battling with your dad or with your mom. I want you to stand up. If that was you, just stand. Just stand. Thank you. I was a youth pastor, 24, and I had that. And I preached about God's love until this revelation happened to me. Oh, I know there's more people. If you grew up in a Slavic home, your heart is beating right now, faster. See, some of you, you're gonna be free. That's why it takes a little bit more boldness. The Lord is gonna break that chain right now and set you free. And you're gonna let your dead go. Release him from the prison that you've put him in. Everybody else, close your eyes and bow your head for just a moment. If you need to stand up, I want you to stand up. If that's your case, if you're bleeding because you've been deprived or maybe you've been rejected, maybe you've been abused and today that's, that's hurting you, that's weighing you down. I feel a tangible presence of the Holy Spirit in this room and I feel like Jesus is crying. That's what I felt when I was praying in the room before the service. I felt this groaning of Jesus and He wanted me to tell you how much He misses you, how much He loves you. He never meant your parents to replace you, Him in your life. He only meant them to introduce you to Him. Some of them did a great job. But those of you standing, some of your parents, maybe unknowingly, they did a poor job. And the appetizer didn't come warm, it didn't come right. And some of you, you left the restaurant disappointed and angry. But I am here today to tell you there's a main meal. And if you just open your heart right there, right now, if you can just stretch your hands like this, like you're receiving a gift, just stretch your hands like this. And say, Holy Spirit, pour out the love of the Father into my heart right now. Everybody else, just pray in the Holy Spirit just for a few minutes. It's fine if you sit it. Just pray in the Holy Spirit for just a few seconds. Holy Spirit, touch her right now. Touch her. Let your oil heal every wound. Every word that was spoken. Everything that was done. The healer of the hearts, Holy Spirit, you are. I pray that she will expect out of you what only you can do. Nobody else can do what only you can do, Holy Spirit. Right now in Jesus' name, let that healing come. Let that healing come. Let it come to that young man who waited all his life and has always been disappointment of his parents. In Jesus' mighty name, let that healing come. Right now. Right now. Right now. Right now. In the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name. I break every rejection. I break every spirit of bitterness. I break every offense in Jesus' mighty name. I break every chain that the enemy has used to bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. Every nightmare that's connected to that, every self-hate, every suicidal 
tendencies that are connected to that in the name of Jesus Christ every rebellion that's connected to that in Jesus mighty name let it be broken today out of your life come on every person praying every person praying oh Holy Spirit oh Holy Spirit right now I ask you that you will remove and remove every grave clothes of bitterness every grave clothes of shame every grave clothes that the enemy has placed on us right now God in the name of Jesus Christ let the love of the Father let the love of the Father let the fellowship of the Holy Spirit wrap our life right now in Jesus mighty name in Jesus mighty name I want you to say this with me say oh Holy Spirit let the love of the Father be poured into my heart and heal every rejection heal every hurt I forgive those who were supposed to love me I release those who have hurt me I bless them help me to love you to live in your love and to honor my father and my mother in Jesus name you may be seated in the presence of the Lord the second thing that the enemy the second grave close the second tape that the enemy likes to use is addiction addiction is when you've tasted some kind of a sin and it becomes a repeated cycle addictions can be to different things <laughs> addictions to be pornography it can be to weed it could be to smoking it could be to lying exaggerating it could be to stealing it could be to cursing it could be to gambling or taking painkillers addiction specifically to pornography painkillers gambling it cripples your life it pretty much binds you but no addiction is stronger than Jesus I know it's a cliche we hear it all the time no addiction is stronger than the power of the blood no addiction is stronger than the power of Jesus it doesn't matter how many times you've tried it doesn't matter how many tried time you pushed that addiction is not stronger than Jesus when Lazarus came out of the tomb I want you to notice something he came out bound Mark if you, if you could just kind of I'm gonna take you follow me I will not misguide you hurry up see when people are bound sometimes it's like come on but it's just I'm going to share something about addiction that I want you to never forget. Mark, so let's go back. Now, nicely, I want you to go back. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. I want you to see this about addiction. Lazarus was dead and he was bound and Jesus spoke a life a word into him and Jesus says Lazarus come alive his heart started beating Lazarus woke up but he was still bound now imagine that a dead person you're at the funeral and somebody's dead and they're bound just like this when they wake up would it offend you that they are wrapped in grave clothes or you would be so ecstatic the fact that they're alive do you think it's a big deal that they're alive I mean yeah do you think it's a big deal that they got rags no but if you are the person in the rags you only feel that it's a big deal that you are in the rags but if you are the outsider it's not a big deal that they're in the rags. The only thing that's a big deal is they're resurrected. I want to send a message to somebody here today who are bound with certain things and you are trapped and you're inside and you feel like this, man, this, this, 
is this is bad this is confusing this is wrong this is not right and this is such a big deal God help me I want to tell you something snap out because the big miracle that's already happened is the fact that you are alive and the only reason why you're bothered by that is because you're alive if you wouldn't be alive if you wouldn't be resurrected the very things you are confused about you would never be bothered by I know it's bad I know it's wrong I know you shouldn't do it but you know what excites me is the fact you're not comfortable in those things because it tells me you've been resurrected my God help me a little bit with that you've been resurrected and resurrection is a big deal your rags are not a big deal your resurrection is your salvation is a big deal your rags is not and maybe those rags right now are addictions and you may say but pastor you don't understand I fall into the same sin yes it's bad yes it's not good but the fact that there is a heartbeat inside of you and the fact that there is a guilt and there is a conviction it tells me you are alive you're alive that's a, that's a resurrection so what if you would have been freed but dead dead people are very well behaved on funerals but that doesn't make them alive sometimes I heard a young man came to me at our church and he says he got kicked out of school for sexual sins you really have to be messed up to be kicked out for sexual sins he was like that messed up he come to me in the lobby in the church and he says pastor Vlad is it wrong for me to smoke weed I said for you no looked at me and said really I said sunshine listen, listen you're going to hell everybody knows it what's the point if you go to hell smoking weed or not smoking weed since you're going there smoke it up he looked at me <laughs> he's like he couldn't believe it. I just told him he's going to hell and I was like think about it whether you go to hell gay or straight you're still headed there I'm like if I would be you going there I would do whatever I want I was like honestly for you bro don't hold back so at least when you're there you know what you're there for I told him your problem is not weed your problem is you're dead in your sin you first need to be resurrected and then you will know that weed is the problem then that's not going to be comfortable no more it's not going to be right no more why because when you come alive something just feels uncomfortable but while you feel confused and while you feel uncomfortable I gotta tell you the rest of us are looking at your life and saying you know what the fact that there is a pressing in the fact that there is a sense of conviction about it it indicates there is life I'm not condoning your sin I'm just looking at something that is real right now and that is the life of God that's beating inside of you but let me give you a practical step on how to get out of the addiction. Jesus tells Lazarus, come out. Mark, I want you to get up. Now, I want you to notice Jesus did not help Lazarus to get out. Come on, give him a round of applause. Come on guys, help me out. Help him out. Oh, Rabbi. Woo! All right, all right. Let's go, let's go. You were good, you were good. Why did you start jumping? Let's go. Up, one, two, seven. Okay, so now come close, close. Look. Dude, stop jumping, okay? Start breaking chains, man. <laughs> Lazarus was not loosed until he got out of the grave on his own. Can you imagine the struggle he had to go through? This is where the struggle is real hashtag started did you did you just see how much you struggled with that so I want you to imagine see most of us think that Lazarus like in a bathrobe he came out like pawn the guy was bound up like like a corpse he was bound up that means he wrestled trying to get in, get up and Jesus says come out meaning Jesus says when you are still bound I'm expecting you being bound to start making moves toward me before I send somebody to get the clothes off it, when your clothes begin to make moves toward me struggling but move toward me hurting but move toward me struggling but move you will fall like he did you will struggle it will not happen first time it might happen first month second month it might happen two years but Jesus says come out 
He said, but Lord, I am bound. He says, I know. Make moves. See, some of us think we have this magical view of Christianity. I just come, everything is gone. It's not always. Sometimes you gotta struggle and move toward God. Mark, let's come a little bit closer. Not only you have to struggle to move toward God if you want to be free from your addiction, but I want you to notice another thing is before you get rid of your grave clothes, you're gonna have to get out of your grave. Write it down. Before God removes grave clothes, I have to get out of my grave. Grave is three things. Trigger points, toxic people, and toxic places. Grave is three things. Write this down. It's trigger points, toxic people and toxic places before Jesus removed the grave clothes excuse me disciples removed the grave clothes the man Lazarus had to get out of the grave he got out of the grave and only then the grave clothes were removed see some of us what we want to do is we want God to get into our grave which is trigger points toxic people and toxic places we want God to come in our grave and there untie us but the Lord says if you really want to be free a few things what is the trigger point for pornography for you Instagram get out of Instagram oh my gosh I can't do that it's your grave if it's snapchat get out of snapchat it's your trigger point what is the trigger point for alcohol for you what is that trigger point? You ask yourself, your trigger point is your grave. You got to get out of it. It doesn't mean you will be free, but God can't bring freedom from this until you get out of that. Are you with me? Toxic places. Toxic places speak of the places you used to be in that was normal. But because you're a Christian, those places now tempt you to go back. You have to no longer go to those places. I know this idea, well, I want to be a missionary there. You're not a missionary there because you're tempted by those places. But I, greater is he that is in me than the one who is in those places. The devil is a liar. Yes, he is greater, but you are not greater than those places. The reason why those places tempt you back and those people tempt you back is for this reason. People in those places and those places are way deeper in their sin than you are in God. And whoever is deeper moves the other. Not whoever is stronger, but deeper. I remember I shared the story a few years ago here at the teens, teens service. I had a young man in our church. His name was Mitchell. He got saved. He was this radical evangelist. He comes from drugs. His mom was a prostitute in Seattle area. Within six months of his salvation, he was doing so good, evangelizing pretty much every night. He was evangelizing so much, he was rebuking me and other pastors on the team and saying, you guys are a bunch of lukewarm, lukewarm people. I mean, we felt ashamed. Of how much we didn't love Jesus compared to this guy. He was so on fire for God. One holiday, he says, I'm going back to Seattle. I'm going to win my mom to Christ. And I said, no, you don't. I said, we don't want you to go to Seattle. He's like, I break every spirit of control. I said, Mitchell, please understand. Your mama has been in prostitution for over 15 years. All of her homies and cronies are drug dealers. Drugs, you're only six months off of it. You're fresh. You're not going to win them to Christ. They will win you back to your old lifestyle. You will see. You don't understand. I pray in tongues two hours a day. As you can pray in tongues until you lose your voice. It doesn't change the fact you're still fresh in this. Stay away from your grave. I said, did you know why Joseph did not witness to Potiphar's wife? Because you don't witness to people you're tempted by. Oh, that, that, that's, that's a tweetable quote right there. I said, you have to run from, from those places. He said, you don't guys don't understand. You don't care about my mom. Who's going to bring the gospel to my mom? I'm like, somebody will, but not you. Not yet. Not right now. Maybe a little bit later. So he rejects our counsel. He goes to Seattle. First three days, he evangelizes to all the prostitutes and all the drug dealers and everything. On the third day, they gave him a little drink and he took a sip. He became a sipping saint. And he got drunk. And he fell back into drugs. He came back two weeks later. He relapsed, 
Oh, did. Mitchell never recovered from drugs. For 10 years, he had three children just so he can help to get out of drugs. He had children to help him get out of drugs and couldn't do it. Until he did so much drug, it messed with his brain and he went mental. One time they locked him up in a local park, not very far from my house, where he ran naked at two o'clock in the morning saying, Jesus loves everybody, naked. They locked him up in the hospital and the hospital transferred him into jail and the hospital made an error by not transferring to jail that he had a problem with his mental health and at night this young man hit his head toward the concrete and killed himself. I performed his funeral. I preached hell hard at that funeral because I didn't care because I warned him and we tried to bring him back. And I've seen the damage it does to people when they don't leave their grave. There are phone contacts on your phone that should be removed. It's your grave. It's the people you dealt with stuff. It's the people that you took stuff from. It's the people that gave you with stuff. And you need to walk out from your grave before God removes your grave clothes. You're saying God take away those feelings but God says take away those friends. God take away those desires but God says get those places out block them out see some of you you keep that as a plan b you keep that as an open bridge in case this thing with God doesn't take over so it doesn't take you a long time to go back to your past burn the bridge to your past because you only have future in front of you is with Jesus are you with me that's how addictions get broken you walk out from the grave you have to a lot of times turn off the computer turn off the and remove the internet from your phone sometimes you have to disconnect from social media completely and trust me you won't die Jesus didn't have Instagram and he made it just fine you have to disconnect one of the girls who got delivered from lesbianism in her church for her trigger point was her Twitter account she had a lot of followers and she had a lot of lesbian people that were constantly in contact with her and now she didn't want to even share her testimony she says that's not my time my time will come to share the testimony but right now I don't want to go back to that and therefore I have to walk out from my grave and that grave is Twitter for me Twitter is a place where I can minister but for her Twitter was her grave what is your grave because before God can remove this you got to walk out of this and no it's not easy you saw how he struggled it's not going to be easy to walk away and people will judge you and they say well you think you're better than me well you think you're holier than me well, 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 well you don't want to hang out with us no more you think you're this and that and you say I'm sorry but I gotta do this Potiphar's wife did not understand why Joseph ran she made up a story that landed him in jail but Joseph knew his purity is more important than his reputation what I feel here is more important than what she says and he didn't flirt with that chica he didn't talk to her and he didn't say well well girl you know you're so fine and let me let me just see if, if we can go up on the mountain and I, and I can you know maybe lay hands on you and just, just, just pray for the spirit of lust and adultery to be broken out of your life you know why he ran from there because he knew the girl is hot but so is hell Too hot to handle. He's like, I, I can't stick around here. And the moment I start doing my missionary dating thing on her, you know, like, well, flirt to convert kind of stuff, then, then she's gonna convert me back to her pagan kingdom and I'm gonna lose my relationship with God. And so he says, you know what, girl, I'm running. She grabbed his clothes, said, you can take that, you can take this and that, but I'm running because my purity is more important. You cannot walk in freedom if you don't leave your grave, period. Guys, there's no ifs and buts, there's no magical prayer, there's a practical thing. Jesus says, This tempts you, cut it off. Remove the grave before God can remove your grave clothes. Are you with me? The scripture says to run from lust. It doesn't say to fight it. It says to fight the devil but run from lust. You know what that tells me? Lust is more powerful than the devil. Because God gives you power to win over the devil. He doesn't give you power to win over lust. He says the only way you're going to win over lust is run. Run. That means that if you see trigger points, all you gentlemen walking in the mall and you see Victoria who lost all of her secrets, all right that means you you tilt your head you look at some other gap or american or apostle or apostle or apostle or whatever apostle that's over there you you move your head all right because that victoria she looks right at you <laughs> And verse you see and then you and there's no this father God I clothe her with beauty and righteousness no 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 leave Victoria alone <laughs> let somebody else go save her 
you go save your soul sunshine <laughs> are you with me if you want to be free from the grave clothes of addiction you gotta leave the grave first I mean you gotta leave places trigger points and people if you want God to remove the spirit of lust the break the addiction of drugs maybe smoking maybe lying maybe some kind of a thing that you're currently battling with everyone bow your head and close your eyes if you're addicted to any of the substances that I just mentioned whether it's painkillers pornography lying stealing gambling or something that and you're sick and tired of it and today you're saying God I want I want you to set me free and you're willing to walk out of your grave and as I was speaking you recognize oh my goodness he's saying the right thing I I need to leave a grave I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand not to get up but to raise your hand keep your hand up I'm gonna pray with you right now thank you thank you keep your hand up for just a few more seconds for those of you who have your hand up I want you to say this out loud say Lord Jesus everybody else let's help them say Lord Jesus I repent for opening the door for the spirit of bondage wash me with your blood in Jesus name I renounce every spirit every chain of addiction and bondage over my life and right now I choose to remove every grave that God points to me whether it's my trigger point whether it's some toxic people or some wrong places in Jesus name help me O Holy Spirit Father God I ask you right now in the name of Jesus every person that has that hand raised I pray that you will pull them out of that grave right now that you will pull them out of that addiction that you will pull them out of that place that you will pull them out Lord God of those trigger points Father I pray that there will be a grace they did not have before to be released right now Lord God that this is not just going to be saying God I'm sorry and don't go and doing it again but something will happen during this fast where this is broken once and for all well we don't walk in lust but we don't we walk in purity we walk in power we walk in the presence of God in Jesus mighty name Father I pray for those who have subscriptions that they know they need to be cancelled for, for those who have certain habits that they know they need to be cancelled that it will happen today not tomorrow and they will be able to walk out of their grave though for somebody else that is not a grave but for them it is in Jesus mighty name in the name of Jesus Christ I thank you Father I thank you for your grace in this room every eye closed closed every head bowed even as I was praying and I was speaking some of you you just felt this from the Lord you gotta disconnect from this thing you gotta cut off the media or you gotta remove the movies or you gotta remove the the Instagram or you gotta remove the the, the the TV shows or you gotta remove this particular particular thing that the Lord just put it on your heart you gotta just go through your Instagram maybe unfollow half of those girls that you are learning how to work out from and you're a guy You can't have God remove your grave clothes if you don't walk out of the grave. And you need to do that today. Not tomorrow, today. In Jesus' name. Lift your eyes now. I'm going to bring this message up to an end. So, sorry guys, I don't have a clock over there. So I'm just, I'm just keep going. Okay, so uh, yeah, put it on the clock, please. Because otherwise, I don't have to. I'm here till Friday. So I'm just taking my precious time. All right. <laughs> and... Uh, so we are going to leave the rest of the two robes alone. You can just write them down the clothes of insecurity and the last one is the clothes of condemnation. Insecurity is the things that the enemy uses to make us feel inferior and the condemnation is when the enemy uses what you've done against you to make you feel like you don't deserve God's love and he doesn't want you to forgive yourself. But toward the end we mentioned one thing is that you're alive that's a bigger deal than the fact that you have rags. Number two we mentioned is that you have to get out of the grave before God can remove the grave clothes. And, and lastly and we have to finish Mark. Um, you have to let people lose you. Don't surround yourself with people who throw stones at bound people. 
some of you, you go to churches that publicly humiliate bound people. I will get in trouble for this, but leave your church. Any church that kills sick people, any hospital that attacks sick people need to be closed down. Hospitals accept sick people. They treat the sick people. They don't stone sick people. Church is the only constitution, the only environment in many churches where the sick people are publicly humiliated, embarrassed, and instead of being helped, they're being pushed and made fun of. Jesus looked to people around Mark and he says, loose him. He didn't say embarrass him. He didn't say bind him. He didn't say make fun of him. He didn't say, you know, just begin to kind of kick him out. Everybody go take a punch at him, pick up a stone and tell him what you think about him. You know, I want you to loose him. You know, your church, the Living Stream Church, the reason why Saturday existed, because pastor and the team don't want the hurting people to be hurting. They provided a specific environment where it was a closed circle that people like that can receive help where they can come clean. Our church is exactly the same but unfortunately there are churches where if you fall into sin pastors love to make a public thing about it. I know every church has a different policy and how they treat the sin, that's up to them. But if at the core of every policy is not to help Mark get his chains out, but for us to pick up anything that you get and start throwing at Mark, if at the core of that we miss the whole point of Christianity, never attack hurting people. Remember how you were hurting and God helped you. Help somebody who's hurting. It, it might mean that they need to be removed from the stage. If they fell in sin and they were on the stage, it might need to be that they removed from the stage, but it doesn't mean they need to be removed from your love. It might, need, it might mean they need to be removed from a leadership, but it doesn't mean they need to be removed from you. Because God will use people to lose us. People. Jesus didn't lose Lazarus, people did it. And I want you to notice one more thing about freedom. It's very, very deep and very profound. Freedom is painful. I said it's painful. <laughs> Sometimes you just don't know where to start. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. All right. So I want you to pause for a second with me, Mark. This is how typically it happens in our life. The Lord removes the big things and leaves us alone because He wants us to do the rest. With prayer, fasting. He wants us to, after that, not to simply say, well, praise God. I don't have those things that embarrass me no more. But He wants us after that to begin to remove the things from our mouth. Go ahead, Mark. Yes, yes. Okay. Man, you should have cut your hair. Oh, be careful, be careful, be careful. Don't be so radical, slow. Okay. So, you want to give a testimony? How was your life before Jesus? Uh, my life before Jesus was so bad. How do you no. feel right now that uh, the chains are gone out of your hands? I feel free, but not just yet. Not just yet, huh? There's a little bit more, huh? A little bit. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to take them off. Slowly but surely, huh? <laughs> fast. Oh, oh. <laughs> Let's do it fast. All right, all right. Your freedom will be exactly the same. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. It's going to, be, it's going to hurt. How did that feel? Great. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, that, that hurt. I mean, that, 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 how you snapped it. It's kind of painful. You, everybody just felt so bad for you. Because they, they, we, we all know how that feels in real life. 
when you begin to apply some discipline it hurts it, it, it's all pretty at the church but you get home and start doing it that hurts are you with me and a lot of times this is where we end we're like well praise God let's go Mark hey guys but I'm not looking at porn I'm not smoking weed I'm not um, I am not uh, stealing no more okay I don't have a prayer life I don't fast when the church fasts I don't tithe I don't give but you know what I'm not doing the bad stuff I'm staying out of jail I don't have any more DUIs praise be to God and this is how most of the Christians just continue to live we just thank God for the big stuff but see Mark is not gonna go home like that will you Mark no why not because I want to run is your Christian life jogging or running anything that doesn't just keep you away from jail but from running needs to be removed not just from jail not just from being excommunicated in your church but from running from God needs to be removed and the Lord is not going to do that you're gonna have to do that with the help of brothers and sisters Mark show us how it's done you gotta find it where it ended right yep break free Jesus have mercy throw it, throw it out throw it out there no sure <laughs> what do you think feel better <laughs> yeah, can you no. just run it back and forth just over there show us that it, it's possible to run come on come on come on you didn't get the tape out to run like that run like a real man well that's better yeah yeah that's good that's good let's give him a round of applause one more time mark take your seat thank you thank you for watching this content i know this was a blessing to you we would like to ask you to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell on our channel so that each time we upload something you can be notified don't forget to share this content with your friends and family and on social media. We're so thankful to you. Better is not good enough. The best is yet to come.